So outline. I'm just going to give a quick background overview of the background. Uh, give a quick overview of the questions I'm asking, the hypotheses, and the conclusions. Um, the data, the results. Implications is sort of the last, but the implications are sort of hand wavy, and the rest of it I try to be as quantitative as possible. Um, and yeah. So background. Why do we care? There's evidence for differential chemical recalcitrance of different chars. So some chars can be more easily mineralized than others. Um, Modeling work suggests a significant mitigation potential. Um, the, a recent paper that Wolf et al. won talks about max, maximum sustainable technological potential at about 12% of current anthropogenic emissions. Um, improvement of crop yields. People have reviewed this. People have made a lot of claims. People are very excited. There's a lot of a lot of reasons for people to think that there's a lot of a lot of crop yield. But as you'll see, there's not as much data as we perhaps like. So the motivation for this, this project is that the mitigation value, the potential of biochar will depend on how, many people, how much people use biochar, which will in large part depend on its values of soil and land. Um, global and local estimates of plant response are needed in order to understand uh, locational marginal cost abatement curve. So a marginal abatement cost curve, for example, you'll save money if you put in a, 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 a CFL. CFL, thank you. Um, but it'll cost you money, at least, in the, at least in the upfront, to put solar panels on your house. So the, the, the range of technologies that are, that are sort of cost negative to cost positive, that's the marginal abatement cost curve. Nobody knows where biochar sits on that. It will depend on its value. Um, and then different biochars are differentially recalcitrant. Agronomic selection based on pyrolysis temperature can affect mitigation potential. So if everybody wants to use low temperature char, it's going to be rated faster. That's going to have a different climate change mitigation pathway, maybe more energy, less um, less sequestration versus a high temperature char, which can be more sequestration, less energy. So that's, 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 that's the background of this all. Um, so biochar, a lot of you know this, so I'll go, I'll go quick through this. Biochar is charcoal applied to soil. Um, it's a connotation, it's not different from other charcoal. You pro, I mean, if you're optimizing for producing energy in charcoal or having a nice thing to burn, you want to use a different type of feedstock and such. But um, it's a connotation that means applying charcoal to soil. Higher process temperatures yield a more graphitic, so more like um, as you go sort of from a lower temperature up to really high temperatures, you start producing graphite. So you get so at around 400, you start producing aromatic carbon. By aromatic, I don't mean it smells good. I mean um, carbon in these sort of cream structures. At a higher temperature, as these start to use sheets, and with increased order and thinness, sheets stack one another. And really, I think it's like probably are beyond the range where we really interested in start producing graphite. Um, so it's kind of like taking biomass and going towards diamonds, but not quite getting there. Definitely not getting anywhere near there, but on that next thing. Um, so, right, so you get lower oxygen to carbon ratios and higher carbon to nitrogen ratios as you go higher temperatures. Mineralization rates, mineralization decomposition of CO2 is um, slow, hundreds of years. Um, and importantly, as you go, as your temperature, your temperature increases, you get something with higher pH, and the pyrolysis temperature increases, you tend to get something with a lower cannabis change capacity. Cannabis change capacity is um, it's a measure of the electronegativity of char. Um, if the units are millimoles, or sorry, centimoles of charge per kilogram. So if something has a high cannabis change capacity, it means that if you add fertilizer to it, it will hold on to the fertilizer better, or any ion. Um, and that's, and a lot of you know this stuff already, simplified pyrolysis, you take biomass, you get combustible gases, cars, and biochar. So, big questions motivating the study here. Um, does biochar need a carbon price to be an economically effective mitigation option? Nobody knows, people think so, there's not that much data. Um, in what context is biochar more effective in improving plant growth? Um, are there optimal concentrations in soil? And by optimal, I mean, are there, you know, so here's, Here's the amount of biochar you add. Here's the plant response. Here's the amount of biochar you add. Does it go like this? Does it go like that? Does it go like that? We don't know. Um, and then, sort of similarly to the economic question, is biochar a byproduct of biofuel or vice versa? It depends quite heavily on, on plant response as well as energy markets and location, all sorts of contextual factors. The specific questions I'm going to, I'm going to try to answer through the study are what's the average change in crop yield per ton per hectare of biochar? Generalizing and controlling for various factors will make different places different. At higher application rates, does marginal yield response decline? Um, how does pyrolysis temperature influence yield response? Um, 
is yield response stronger in acidic or more highly weathered soils? Um, and is there a diff difference in yield response uh, to biochar in the tropics versus the temperate zone? So I'll give you my conclusions and I'll give you my data afterwards so you know where I'm trying to go. So uh, average yield response to biochar, so yield response is the normalizing uh, growth of um, the growth of the control treatment to one. What's the percentage increase and decrease above, above that? So average yield response to biochar in the studies analyzed is 3.9%, plus or minus 1.4 per ton per hectare of biochar, um, or 4.3%. When you went in treatments that had some amount of fertilizer, and fertilizer being a categorical variable, you're either zero or one. I didn't, I didn't control for different levels that were used in different studies. Um, yield response declines at higher application rates, um, but in no cases that I find a statistically significant net negative response. Um, yield response is positively correlated to production temperature. It's a weak correlation, there's a lot of things that mediate it, but in general, higher temperature biochars produce better, uh, produce better plant response. Um, yield response is related to biochar's ability to raise pH and raise cation stage capacity where baseline values are low. So it's a matter of what you're starting from that matters quite a lot. Um, in the tropics, it's a lot about liming, increasing pH, and in the temperate zone, it's a lot about increasing head exchange capacity, although as you'll see later as I get through the data, the, the lining response is a lot clearer in the tropics. The head exchange capacity story is a little shakier, there's a lot more going on. The head exchange capacity anyway is sort of a proxy variable, it relates to plant nutrition, but it's not the prime mover, it's a, it's a sponge, not a what's in the sponge effect. Um, so here's where these studies come from. Ignore the numbers on this, this is citations of the paper I'm trying to put together. Um, but essentially what you'll see is there's a whole lot of clustering. Um, Colombia has been very well studied. Brazil, somewhat. Australia has been very well studied. Um, nothing East Africa. Nothing tropical West Africa. Very little in Europe. India, with first highly clay soils in a lot of places, totally not studied. Um, Western Europe is not studied. Um, so this is what we have, and this is what it's based on. This is an early analysis, and more data will, will fill this in a lot better, but this is what we're working with now. And when I, when, when I, when I put this up here, this is... Um, published literature, not just academic literature, but primarily. Uh, and these are all studies where they, I had to throw away studies where I couldn't um, piece out how much biochar was added to the soil. When they say we added this much, I couldn't use that because I wanted to know how much they, they threw in. Um, and where they didn't um, control biochar well. So where, so I can't, I can't compare um, soil with nothing to biochar plus fertilizer because that's not a good control. Um, so a lot of studies that were controlled didn't get into this. So this, this is the limitation on data that we got here. Plants, um, the main plants that we looked at were rice, corn, and radish, weirdly enough. Um, Australians like to use radish as a bioindicator, which is pretty much why, that, why that's the case. And most of it's in the greenhouse, some of it's in the field. Um, I'm, general, I'm generalizing across between greenhouse and field, which is a weakness of this, this stuff, but with the, with the small number of studies we have, it's sort of inevitable at this point. Um, this, this chart tries to get at who collected what data and what you can throw into a statistical model given the fact that we have really not the best data collection in the world. So here are all the studies that I'm using. Um, everybody reported application rate. A lot of people reported temperature. A lot of people did not report the temperature paralysis. Um, percent carbon, carbon nitrogen, pH. I guess the whole point of this chart is to show there's a lot of holes in the data, so pulling out any, any, any sort of any inference about causation with statistical methods is going to be really hampered by the fact that the minute you try to throw one variable in there, you're going to lose a whole lot of, um, a lot of your observations. So you can't, so if you think that something that doesn't have a lot of data points is really important, you can't pull it out with this, these methods yet. So here's how I transform the data, you know, commonly, um, when you look read one of these papers, they say, you know, for our control, we got X grams of biomass. For our fertilized treatment, we got X grams of biomass. For our biochar, we got another, another value. Biochar plus fertilizer, we got another. So what I did is I took, I, I took a, a treatment control, so a soil with nothing plus soil with biochar. And that was a paired growth trial. And the plant response, this should say YR, um, equals the biomass yield of the one divided by the biomass yield of the other, minus one. Um, simple, so you get a percentage change. Percentage of that is. Same thing with the fertilized. So, right. Um, 
and these are all data in total biomass. So I'm not looking at specific, specifically whether it's crop biomass or above ground. I normalize it using a regression to figure out, you know, if I if I know the above ground, this is how I can transform it into below ground. And it's a pretty robust relationship, statistically speaking. Biomass yield. You're talking about the mass of the plant or the fruit. Mass of the plant. So some some studies. So essentially, what happened was that some studies had. Um, uh, some studies reported above ground, below ground yield, or crop yield, and total biomass yield. Other studies only reported some of those. So what I did was I, I, I um, did a regression, a simple linear regression between um, between above ground biomass and total biomass. Got the got the central estimate, which or just got the, got the regression line, which was um, had a really high R squared, really, really well predicted. And for those studies that only reported above ground, I used the model value to fill in what the total value would have been. The above ground and below ground is, I think, good data, but I think that what's really relevant is for the produce, the uh, I, did, I, did, I did the same thing for crop and for total, and got the regression line, and where they only gave me crop, I could convert that into total. And it's not going to be perfect, but, you know, this physical model is going to have, this is, you know, this is why you really look at it with a grain of salt. So did, was it pretty much a comparison between crop and plant above and below ground? Is it pretty much the same thing? What I'm assuming here, which um, is probably an imperfect assumption, but I think that it's relatively defensible for the stage of data that we have, is that if you increase your total biomass production, you're also going to increase your crop. And of course, in the real world, that's, that's, a, that's an assumption you'd want to relax. But um, for these purposes, I think it's in the aggregate, it's going to be relatively robust. But you know, it's a whole, for sure. In the ideal world, we'd have that data, we don't. So here's the raw data. Um, you don't see much of a trend, do you? Uh, I mean, you see it's generally above zero. <coughs> this is the real response. Um, the response to the bio, the bio chart compared to the control. And this is the application rate. Um, notice they're all clustered at the lower rates, which is normal. I mean, biochar is very lightweight stuff, and you can't imagine somebody putting 100 tons per hectare on an actual hectare. Um, so a lot of the higher ones come from, uh, come from greenhouse trials, where they mix it in pots. Um, the raw data, uh, later I'll, I'll control for a lot of the factors um, and get, try to get better trends out of it. But, you know, what you see, you get some negative. Um, in some places it doesn't work very well, in places it works very well. Um, there's one study that had pro, pro weight entirely that was along, along the scale was 3,000%. But the reason it was 3,000% was that the, one, the control didn't produce anything. So, again, take these methods with a grain of salt because um, a lot, of, a lot of some of the things will be artifacts of the par parameterization. So here is the model specification for estimating yield response. Um, how many of you have looked at a linear regression within the past five, ten years? Okay. So linear regression. Essentially, what I'm doing is I'm taking the application rate, um, taking whether or not it was fertilized, taking the initial soil pH, and taking the high treatment temperature. Putting them all in the equation and estimating what is the best coefficient to put in front of that value um, to make the whole thing equal yield response. Um, it's done through computer programs that estimate the best coefficient to, to do so. But essentially it allows me to say that you know, if, I, if I lower my pH by one point, there's some coefficient which allows me to predict my yield response. So um, that's essentially what this is. I did two models. Um, one of them, and Regression, linear regressions are called models. Um, one of them is estimated yield response with uh, the amount of biochar fertilizer, soil, initial soil pH, and with the uh, highest temperature. The other, and that one has 72 data points. Um, this one here only uses uh, application rate and, and uh, whether or not it's fertilized. It has a lot more because it's not model. Model one had to throw out every study that didn't re report high stream temperature, didn't report soil pH. So that's why I use both. The, be the top model is a, is a better one, it incorporates more features. Bottom one has more observations in it. Here's the results. So, model one at the top. Um, so basically, so here's how to look at this. Um, this axis here is plant response per ton per hectare biochar. Um, so, and this is the different groups. So this is all observations, those who are fertilized, those who are not fertilized, those in the tropics, those in the temperate zone. 
Um, and then for each of those, there's